This is Success Stories. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy <laughs> University. I'm joined today by a very special guest, Mr. John Allison. Mr. Allison was actually instrumental to the founding of the Emanuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy here at Troy, as BB&T is one of the initial givers, along with uh, Manuel Johnson himself and the uh, Charles Koch Foundation. Mr. Allison was chairman and CEO of BB&T Corporation. He was president and CEO of the Cato Institute. While he was at BB&T, he took it from a $4.5 billion company, a, 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 company, a bank with $4.5 billion of assets, and grew it to a company of over $152 billion in assets. He is a very talented, very energetic person, and somebody who has been philanthropic as well. He has given a lot of money to free market causes. So I want to start, John, thank you for being here, by asking you about the moral foundations of capitalism. When you were at bb and one of your major initiatives was giving to free market institutes and faculty and making sure that the ethical and moral foundations of capitalism were being taught. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, it was kind of we kind of stumbled in that into this sense. We were looking at we were making significant contributions to universities. Kind of banks are expected to do uh, from a regulatory perspective community investment. We've long been focused on uh, on college level education, but we were looking at a lot what was happening to our money, and it wasn't going to things that would help BB and T or help, in our view, the world. It just and so we decided we'd create a program on the moral foundations of capitalism because our research showed that most people realize that capitalism produced a better standard of living. But the many people, almost the majority of people, thought capitalism was at best amoral, but most people thought it was an immoral system. And our question, which we posed in, in these programs, was how can an immoral system produce better outcomes? Obviously, we think capitalism is moral or it wouldn't be producing a superior outcome. We did create 62 programs on moral foundations of capitalism. We had 25 or 30,000 students go through these programs each year. We, one of the requirements we, when we made our contributions was to get feedback whether the students thought they were learning anything. And the vast majority of st students said they really enjoyed the program and even though most of them were business majors and were in their senior year, they said nobody ever talked about capitalism from a, you know, a broader social policy perspective of all the courses they took. And m many of them described it as life changing. Well, and you had a similar sort of revelatory experience when you were a student at UNC Chapel Hill and you encountered Ayn Rand for the first time. Tell me about that. Yeah, uh, Alan, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I went to business school at the University of North Carolina and I, I did very well grade wise, but I really wasn't particularly happy in the sense I, I drank too much alcohol as some students do and, and I was really searching, I guess, for a purpose in life. And uh, I was in a bookstore, I, I like to read books, and, and there's this book called uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And I never had heard of Rand, Ayn Rand, never heard anything about her, I picked it up. And while I was in the bookstore, I started reading the first chapter and I couldn't stop. Hmm. Very powerful. And of course I finished the book and then I've got uh, every copy of, of Rand's books and all the books she recommended uh, over, the, over the course of several years and became very interested in and learned a lot about her philosophy. And it had, a, for me, a profoundly positive influence on my life. It gave me a clear sense of purpose and it helped me focus on what you really needed to do to live a meaningful life. Well, over the course of the 20th century, depending on how you count the figures, whether you count direct killings or starvation or uh, other forms of death, Socialism and communism killed upwards of 100 million people, 100 million dead bodies in the world. It should be obvious after figures like Pol Pot and Mao and Stalin that these socialist <coughs> and communist ideologies, these ideologies of a totalitarian state are destructive and dangerous and yet we still have mainstream politicians supporting viewpoints that uh, that are consistent with those ideologies can how do you how do you explain that 
I really don't have a great explanation, Alan. I, I think it actually, it's hard, let's leave the politicians in out and look at the other people that support socialism. And uh, what our studies have shown today, the majority of, not a huge majority, but the majority of college students think socialism is a better system than a free market. Um, I think it begins in our school systems. I think the teachers have been indoctrinated, not because they realized they were being indoctrinated, but uh, they have been, and they teach these socialistic ideas without really understanding how the system works. And of course, a lot of the students that say they like socialism don't really understand what it means, but they think they understand what it means. Um, the politicians are, are kind of an interesting phenomenon to me because effectively what they've done with socialism is make tons of promises. Mm. You know, free everything, <laughs> free yeah. everything. And you're gonna wait, raise, so I think, I think on welfare now, you're gonna be able to make you know, $75,000 a year and get welfare. It's just a huge percentage of the population. And you can argue, I don't think it's their real intent because these people really believe in socialism, which is a lot more scary, mm -hmm. frankly. But I don't think it's their intent to necessarily buy votes, but the practicality is it buys votes. Because there are a lot of people that realize they might be beneficiaries, even if the United States happens to go broke in the interim, uh, which w it will, because <laughs> we can't afford a lot of what's been proposed. Now what's gonna actually get en enacted, I don't know, but what's been proposed is scary. It, it, it sure is. Now, your story at bb and is very interesting. It's unusual for someone to graduate from college, go into an int entry-level position at, at, at whatever sort of business it is, and work all the way up to the position of CEO. Can you talk about that process? I mean, you were at bb and for a long time. Can you talk about the trajectory of your career over the course of time, what it was like to start and I'm sure you had no earthly idea <laughs> when you started that you were going to be CEO of that bank one day. Yeah, that's true, uh, true Alan. I was raised in a very modest income family, maybe you could argue low income family. My dad started making some money, but he, you know, he went to work at 17 years old and then went and fought in the World War II, et cetera. And, and we really didn't have a lot and, and I was the first member of our family that graduated from college so it was kind of a, and I went I got my job at bb &T. this is kind of humorous because I really wanted to go back to law school not that I had any idea what lawyers do <laughs> but I thought I'd go back to law school and I graduated in in uh, January and you can't I couldn't go to law school till the next you know session started in August or September so I needed a job <laughs> and then I got it into the banking business or business world in general and I, uh, I really liked it, and I said I enjoyed it more than I would law school. And um, I started out, they, <laughs> they were working on having a training program. <laughs> and I was hired into the potential training program in process, but the training program consisted of wandering around the bank and doing the very <laughs> job. I was a teller. <laughs> now, it's interesting, some of that's pretty valuable. You know, be, you get to learn a lot about human sure. nature being a teller. Some of it you don't want to bother to learn. But, and it, this will be humorous, the technology's changed so much. bb and had no computer system. Now, computers were new, but most banks had them. Wow. <laughs> and uh, what we did is each, we kept our records, each physical branch. Oh, so wow. the Goldsboro branch had the records for Goldsboro. And the way we kept them, is we had this big card that had your name on it, and they put it in the machine when you crashed a check <laughs> and changed change the balance of the card oh, by the wow. machine. <laughs> wow. Well, <laughs> what was the biggest change in, in technology over the course of your career for banking? I mean, I can think of probably a number of them, oh, all the way up to cryptocurrency, but... There have been a huge change, but the basic change was the introduction of computer systems, the technology yeah. that came from that, and the knowledge you got from that. Um, Anyway, that's the environment I went into, and then uh, they put me in a, in the what they called the credit department in those days, where you made some loans. The bank was real, real conservative, a super conservative <laughs> lender, which was actually a problem because they had such a low loan to deposit ratio they couldn't make any money, mm -hmm. and and 
And again, it was run by a lot of nice old guys, <laughs> but there weren't any young people. There were very few young people. And they put me in the credit department where you wrote down what happened. <laughs> well, I physically wrote it down. It's unbelievable. But I got uh, interested in making some changes got, and got developed a relationship with the other, only other young guy there. <laughs> and uh, we um, completely did the, the training program. And I think, frankly, in retrospect, we made it world class. We went from terrible to world class. Uh, we, we got involved in recruiting and convinced the management that was all older that we desperately needed to hire young people. And, and, uh, so we, and we trained them really well. One of the, the aspects of our training programs, all, the, all our hires had to read Atlas Shrugged. And now, we, you didn't have to agree with it. You know, we just made sure you, you'd read it. Uh, over time, I think it was actually, not that people became objectivism, which is the philosophy of Ayn Rand. I don't think they became objectivists, but I think they were definitely influenced by Atlas, partly because the heroes are business people and they're very inspirational. And it's very hard to find inspirational business people in literature. Mm, and literature true. is very powerful, and I think it was a huge factor for, for BB&T. Um, and then over time, we, we got much more sophisticated, and we started doing um, examinations and, and uh, IQ tests and all kind of stuff in our hiring, mostly looking people that were for like the logical thinkers. But by then, I had moved on, and I, I became a, uh, a, a farm lender, and because and BB&T was... 80% farm bank and I, oh, wow. I and I said it was interesting I uh, I made a lot of loans on hogs and chickens and <laughs> oh, <laughs> dairy that. operations and corn and soybeans and tobacco was a big crop then oh yeah well I was <laughs> and, and you live in Winston-Salem now so you're sort of in that uh, area of the country yeah, it's kind of you know it's pretty much died in the U.S. now but which is good. I mean, I don't have any empathy. And we actually helped in the Eastern North Carolina when they started putting pressure on the the, uh, the uh, entitlement kind of things they had for tobacco. And we brought in uh, sweet potatoes, and it's become a huge crop. In fact, I got a national award from the Sweet Potato Association <laughs> for bringing oh, in sweet really? potatoes to North Carolina. It's a big <laughs> industry now, oh, and nobody wow. was growing sweet potatoes, but we proposed that as a substitute as tobacco allotments started going away and stuff. Well, so between Atlas Shrug and The Fountainhead, which one do you think is the better novel? Well, I'm a big Atlas Shrug fan. I yeah. like the, the Fountainhead, but Atlas Shrug is just a fantastic integrated philosophical presentation. Well, you talked about the representation of the, the, the business person as the hero yes. in Atlas Shrugged. And I'm wondering why it is that in our culture, the business person is typically portrayed as the villain. And I wonder whether that has to do partially <coughs> with a misunderstanding of capitalism fundamentally and the association of it with, say, cronyism. And that's something that you uh, have, have spoken about a lot is the problems of cronyism. Uh, would you like to sort of tease out the distinction between capitalism and crony capitalism? Yeah, I think that's a really very important point. And one point you have to emphasize because people, when you start talking about capitalism, they think you're talking about cronyism right. and about people getting favors from the government, which is, I think, very wrong. But capitalism, the government can't dole out favors. It just, that's just, it's, it's prohibited from doing that. It has a role. Its role is basically uh, protecting individual rights, just like natural defense, police force, good good uh, court system not doling out favors and and, and, and it, I think it's really sad a that we have so much cronyism and b that's what people think capitalism is and you can understand people's opposition to to cronyism and we are adamantly opposed to cronyism and I was at BB&T we would talk about that I mean in that place it was con it was concretized because we were competing with a lot of banks that were getting huge subsidies from the government and we wouldn't play uh, which financially was a burden but the biggest risk is, a, is the regulators wanted you to play because mm. if you were playing cronyism then they had a lot more control 
and they had a lot harder time controlling us because we ran a super sound bank from a risk perspective and we weren't playing any of the funny games that were going on, which they let us alone because they didn't want to fight about it because they knew it wasn't, wasn't supposed to be happening, but they didn't like it. I mean, it was, it was very, very interesting. But uh, crony capitalism, unfortunately, and I, and I have observed it's gotten much worse in my career. Mm. It's increased exponentially. Um, and a lot of, and it's interesting what happens, and I saw some of this at Cato. You take a lot of these very successful firms, Microsoft, uh, uh, fir firms like that, they actually started out opposed to the government being in their business. And then, basically the government went after them. And, it, and they had to, in order to basically save their business, pay up. So, I mean, you, you can argue the, com the government doesn't want cronyism. I would argue it, do it wants it because it, it, it's a lot of control for the government. So they went after Microsoft, and Microsoft, purely in self-defense, started hiring people in D.C., and, and unfortunately what happens is they get addicted. And then Microsoft tries to use regulatory pressure to prevent other people from competing with it. And I, I saw that multiple, multiple times in D.C. In DC. Companies that were, I'd say, pure, they got very successful, very big, and the government caused the companies to become uh, cronies. <coughs> and the only good thing, because my observation also over time, it's a pretty high failure rate among cronies. That, that, you know, this perception of, oh, you're a cronies, that means you'll be successful. No because the government can turn on you for any reason it wants to, and it will. Well, and you have new administrations, you get new political <laughs> leaders over time. And new and different valuations. So I think being a crony is, is, is very dangerous, but people are. And then, of course, they make big contributions to politicians. It's, sure. And then yeah. the, the other politicians might not be getting money from Microsoft, but they're getting money from another company. You know, so they all kind of have this, <laughs> we, we'll a, all do this and it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a cycle. Well, how did objectivism influence your managerial principles and style? It had a profound influence on our business. Even though, you know, people liked Atlas Shrugged, but they didn't come, become objectivists, most of them. It's a complex philosophy and also it's, it's not religious and a lot of people are religious. But it's still basically, it's, it's, the, we there, there really ten core principles in objectivism about human behavior. Uh, reason, in other words, you're going to make logical decisions based on the facts. Uh, uh, reality, you know, you start with the facts. Is how you develop reason. Independent thinking, i.e., thinking for yourself from the facts of reality, which is the foundation for creativity. And it's a foundation for people taking personal responsibility. And those kind of factors. And we were able uh, to take all that and put it in a way that most people could understand it. And it became very, it was really objectivism, frankly, almost purely, but written in a way and interpreted in a way that the average guy could uh, understand it. I would argue that many more people are close to being objectivists than have any idea of what it is. They get offended oftentimes by the religion and also by a lot of objectivists can be very offensive. You know what I mean? They, they're just so certain just the they're right. You know, and, and you know, people don't like to be around people that are so certain they're right. And I did I never push it as objectivism. We just talk, talked about these core principles. I sold them to our executive management team, which who had read Atlas Shrugged, but probably, I don't know if many of them made the, the direct connection. And um, we built it into our culture, and I actually think it's a, the main reason for our success. When I took over, really when I took over as uh, president of the bank, it was, it was only about, I don't know, maybe $2 billion in assets before I became CEO. And we incorporated that philosophy into everything we did, it was written, and when I became CEO, I made it a priority. Mm -hmm. And everybody had, they had that test, that they understood 
what the implications of this were and half your performance evaluation was did you make enough loans and get enough you know that kind of stuff actual you know but the other half was are you adherence with, with our values and interestingly enough very high correlation almost everybody that had performance problems had philosophical problems now sometimes they could buy short-term results but they always came around to haunt them oh that's super interesting so we talked about this earlier, but the course of human history, recorded human history, the standard of living looks something like this. You've heard the hockey stick where it goes like this, and then somewhere around the 17th century it starts to creep up, and then 18th and 19th century it shoots up. The hockey stick phenomenon is what a right. lot of economists uh, refer to that as. What is your explanation for that sudden boost in the quality of human life? I think it was really um, a tr tremendous revelation that started in the 1600s. And it started really with the, what they call the Age of Enlightenment, which is the Age of Reason. <laughs> you know, for, and, and I have to be careful not to step on too many people's toes. For many, many years, people were dominated by rich, witchcraft at one time and then by religious beliefs that weren't necessarily connected to reality. They, you know, they came from you know, the primitive ideas. But uh, the age of reason, where rational thinking got respected, and the Catholic Church, by the way, supported that. That's interesting. They were major factors in that. And that led to a lot of advances in science. And interestingly enough, it led to a lot of advances in, in how government op operates in the terms of the principles of uh, first individual rights. People, was, they started having an American uh, constitution is a huge example of that. I mean, that's a breakthrough document. Sort of the instantiation of enlightenment it, thought. Uh, it, really, it really is. It's enlightenment thought put together in a very powerful way. And then, and then you started getting uh, out of that on the economic side. You get uh, more individual rights from an economic perspective. You finally get free markets. And then what we call capitalism, real capitalism. And it transformed the quality of life on the planet. And it's amazing to me, because I speak a lot at universities, how few students, including business students, even know about that pro or even know about the hockey curve. Mm. How could you teach in a business school and not make sure your students knew about that and what caused it? I mean, you can't pretend that there's no cause. And that's a, that's a phenomenal offense of capitalism because it didn't happen by chance. Yeah, I think a lot of curricula will get into the weeds without looking at the big picture. And right. too often that's where the problems start. Well, in the last couple of minutes we have, I want to ask you about your transition from being the CEO of a bank, a large bank, to being the CEO of a nonprofit think tank in Washington, D.C. How were those two experiences different? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. As you stated earlier, BBT, we've had a phenomenal success story, one of the best in the industry, frankly. And I actually retired expecting to teach at a university. I always thought I would enjoy doing that. But I got recruited to take over as CEO of Cato. Cato had been very successful a long time but under a CEO. Unfortunately, that CEO started having an alcohol abuse problem, serious alcohol abuse problem. And I was recruited by the board and by Charles Koch, who actually owned, long story, but owned Cato. And um, Charles probably, he was a good friend of mine. He is a good friend of mine, and he talked me into going. And when I got there, I, first, Cato was losing money hand over fist. It had been successful for a long time, and then with this fight started. And, of course, the CEO, the old CEO, Cato, was putting out a bunch of lies about what was happening. You know, or you can call it his perspective. I'd call it lies. And, it, you know, donations had collapsed, and we were losing money hand over fist. Nobody told me, you know, how bad it was, of course. And maybe I figured out how bad it was when I got there. And uh, the first six months were not fun. And the other thing, in addition to the financial situation, the, the old CEO 
ran the whole thing as a one-man operation. It had 150 employees, and most of them were intellectuals. I mean, really sort of smart people. But he, it was his thing. And he, he, his compensation system was he kind of had a dartboard. He didn't technically have a dartboard, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out why anybody got paid what they got paid. There was no, and there was no, in fact, there was no performance evaluations, none of the basic stuff you have in business. And there was no plan. There was no strategic plan. And when I started talking about, well, we kind of need to know where we're going, I got huge opposition because they said, that's not a libertarian idea. Libertarians don't know where they're going. I'm thinking, wait a minute now. <laughs> let's, hope, let's hope libertarians at least reflect a little bit on where they're going. So I started, I, I had this uh, uh, session of the, 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 the top level officers, and there's about 20 of them uh, in the session. And I started off talking about why we needed a strategic plan, and that's what their role was. And I got about halfway through the session, and everybody was smoking, and they were just criticizing every single thing we did. And I, you know, and some uh, of them worse than others. And so that's fine. If you don't want to participate in this process, great. Go back to your office. I won't miss you. But I am going to have a strategic plan. <laughs> you may or may not like it, and you will be held responsible to it. It could impact your it will impact your performance and compensation in the future here in this organization. All of a sudden, everybody started participating. <laughs> it was like, oh, and we developed a strategic plan. And what was interesting about it, when it was over, almost to a person, or maybe it was one person that disagreed, everybody liked the process. They said, wow. That was a really helpful thinking exercise. And then we turned Cato around and when I left, we were making money hand over fist. <laughs> well, that is an amazing story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today has been Mr. John Allison, and this has been Success Stories. Thank you for watching.